Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. Last week, we began this new series entitled Becoming Who You Are, and we're making our way through a New Testament letter called Ephesians. And we mentioned this last week that it breaks down into three parts. We're just in the first part here, and it is all about our identity in what Paul says is found in Jesus, in Christ. And then in the second part, he's going to apply that to real life. Okay, if that is who we are and the difference that a relationship with God makes, what does that look like day to day? in our relationships, in our homes, in our jobs, in our families. And he's going to get very specific about some ways to apply that. And then the final part talks about winning the battle in our souls. Those battles that in and of ourselves, we just can't seem to muster the strength to win. Where do we find the power to do that? And he's going to talk about that as he wraps this up. But here in the first part, we are talking about our identity and who we are in Jesus. And let me start this way. Did you know that we live in a VUCA world? And if you don't know what that is, that's an acronym developed by the U.S. Army College, and it was done around the time of 9-11 on those attacks. And what does that stand for? It stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. Anybody willing to agree that we live in a VUCA time? (laughs) You know, if that was true at 9-11, I think, you know, these years later with the pandemic and everything else that's happening, it is VUCA. And why this is important to start with is because when the Apostle Paul was writing this letter, it was to people who were also living in a VUCA world, where things were unpredictable and uncertain for them. And as they followed Jesus, there was a lot of pushback, and there was a lot of conflict, and there were a lot of ways in which it was difficult to live life and honor God and walk with other people. And so maybe that's why, right out of the chute, as Paul recognizes people that he knows, people that he loves, people that he had spent two and a half years with, he comes out of the chute by saying, hey, do you know what difference it makes to be in a relationship with God? Here are all the things that belong to you, and they are not tied to the circumstances around you. They are things that simply God grants you and gives you. So last week we began, and let me ask you this question once again, who are you? And how we answer that question, there are a lot of different ways that we could, you know, sort of fill in the blank that might come along with that where we say, well, I am what? And boy, are there a lot of ways in which we can do that. Can I give you my sense of what our common culture um, version of that answer would look like, you know, depending on who we are? That I am my performance plus the opinion of others. And there are ways in which maybe we go to work and we do really well, and maybe even we are driven to work really hard because when that happens, people view us a certain way, and that is my performance, and then others will view me as somebody of value. Or maybe I want to make sure that my kids are really good kids because when my kids are really good, that will reflect well on me, and so people will view me a certain way. But I think we all know this, right, that things that we do don't always move up and to the right. And so maybe they downsize and my job is lost. And if I've tied my identity to that, well then who am I if I'm out of that job? If my kids go off the rails, who am I? And how will people view me? And maybe some of us, when we were really young, we learned this lesson, that you bring home really good grades and it feels really good what's on the other side of that. Or you work really hard and you keep your nose right and your, you know, your path straight and everything's okay. Can I tell you about the time um, in which I lived out my 15 minutes of fame? You ever heard that phrase that everybody's got 15 minutes of fame in this world? Mine came in eighth grade, okay? So we had middle school and I was on the boys soccer team and we were in a playoff game and we won that playoff game one to nothing and I scored the goal. So the next day, they had something called morning announcements, and they, you know, told you pretty much everything, you know, that you need to know that day. And they said, 
And the boys' soccer team won their playoff game one to nothing, and the goal was scored by Roy Gruber. And so I walk into my first class, and this is a literal quote. The teacher looks over, sees me come in, and goes, there's the hero of the school. <laughs> and I got to tell you, that felt pretty good. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was also the pinnacle of my sports career, which kind of <laughs> nosedived. So my 15 minutes of fame was used up in eighth grade by scoring one goal, and yet there were people who viewed me a certain way as a result of that. I think we even heard it in the story. That my self-identity, my self-worth was found in the way that I did things for other people. And maybe that's why Paul, understanding some of those dynamics that have been around forever, begins by saying, notice who you are in Jesus. These are not the things that you do. These are the things that God does. And God is not just the part that you add to these you know, factors of your life. He changes so much. So last week, we began by looking at this, in Christ, and that's really one of the key phrases, and we think, well, that's such a small phrase. What does that really mean? I mean, it seems so coincidental, but what he's talking about is being in that relationship with God, one where we put our hope and our trust in him, and we recognize that he's invited us, not just to know that there's a God, but to walk with God and to trust that God and to put all of our hope into him. And in that place, in that relationship, here's where we began. We are incredibly blessed. Everything at God's disposal, all his resources are made available to you. And we are chosen by God. It even says before the foundation of the world, God chose you. God decided in your favor. So when we say yes to God, his yes is already there. But he says, I know you and I want you not just to be on my team. I want you to be in my family. And you can never leave. You can never be kicked out. And I'm a loved child of God. He's adopted me as his own. And will keep me there forever. But Paul is not done. And as I mentioned last week, he writes the longest single sentence in all of the New Testament, a run-on sentence, coming out of the chute by saying, here are all the things that you have in Christ. So we began there, and today we're going to look at three more truths about you and Jesus. Here's the first one. I am freed to follow him. Here's where that comes from. In Ephesians 1, 7 and 8, in him, and there it is again, 10 times in chapter 1, in him, in him, in him, here's what we have. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Redemption is one of those words that sounds really churchy and spiritual, doesn't it? Redemption sounds really good. What does it really mean? Let me give you a modern version and then let me give you an ancient version that I think Paul is tapping into here. But a modern version for us to understand, I knew a guy in the East Coast, he was a pastor and he was a pastor in New York City and on 9-11, the day of the attack, he was preaching a sermon. It happened there, um, you know, on the morning just a couple days before the attack. And when he came out, his car that he had parked had been towed. And so he had to go find that car. It was taken to an impound yard because apparently he had parked illegally. And so when he gets there, there's a sign to get your car back. And you know what it said? Redemption Center. <laughs> and when he went in and paid the fine to get his car out, you know what they stamped his ticket with? Redeemed. <laughs> and when you think of that word being used in our context, here's what it, it means. It's more than just paying a debt. That's one thing. And that can be very important. But it is paying a debt so that something, an object of value, is brought out of confinement. And that's how Paul is using that word here. We have redemption. Redemption is a payment that has been made to free someone. And to free someone from what? Well, the context in which Paul is using this 2,000 years ago, this is a slave market term. And back then, they had a form of slavery. It was different than the kind of slavery we had here 150, 200 years ago, where you could voluntarily put yourself into slavery. Why would you do that? Because you've run out of options. 
and there was no social support network. So what are you going to do to eat and to have a roof over your head every day? Well, you could sell yourself into slavery. And you owed a debt that you could never pay back, and that was how you were going to live the rest of your days. And somebody could show up in that slave market when you were being bid out for, to, for somebody to own, and somebody could pay your price, and somebody could walk out of there freed. And that is what Paul is using this word for. That's the picture of redemption. And you say, well, in what way were we on the slave market to sin? Redemption means to redeem or even to ransom. To pay a price to get somebody out of harm's way. To get them out of enslavement. It's paying the price to free a slave. And if we ask the question, okay, well, in what ways are we enslaved? Thank goodness we don't have that kind of slave market as a part of our culture today. And we recognize in some part of the, parts of the world that still happens, but it doesn't happen here. So what does that mean to us? Let me ask you this. Somebody who gives in to addiction on a regular basis, would you call that enslavement? I would. What about somebody who gets up and goes to work every day? with the goal and the desire that, you know what, what I do today and what I do through this career, that is ultimately going to be the final word on who I am and how valued I am. I would say that person's enslaved too. How about the person who puts all their hopes and dreams in how their kids turn out and thinking that will reflect on me. And I think that person's enslaved. And it's enslavement because the end result is really out of our control. It is unpredictable. It is something that is uncertain. It may or may not happen. And it may not happen due to factors that are even beyond my ability to control them. And so really, I'm enslaved to forces larger than myself. And where does that lead me? And so Paul says, you know what you have in Jesus? You have something that has been accomplished and something that is not subject to the circumstances of this world that can be taken away through maybe your own failure or the failure of people around you, it is something that God has done for you. Can I nerd out on some grammar in Ephesians chapter 1 for a minute? Who's excited about nerdy grammar? Um, here's, you know, the way that verbs work, right? There are active verbs and there are passive verbs. And if you can take your mind all the way back to high school English class, active verbs are things that people are actually doing. And passive verbs are actions that are being committed upon someone. In Ephesians chapter 1, there's a whole slew of verbs. Every active verb, you know who the actor is, the one carrying out the action? It's God. With every passive verb, who is the one who is receiving what God has done? is people who are in Christ, in Jesus. It's us. God is the one doing the action we receive. I fear that a lot of times we approach a relationship with God and we're looking for redemption in ourselves or something that we do to establish our value in some way. And Paul says, no, you know what? He did it. He redeemed you. He paid a price to set you free so that you could follow him. And what that means is we have nothing to prove. And we can find our identity, our sense of self-worth and things that aren't tied to the circumstances of life. If my job goes away, but I'm secure in who I am in Jesus, it doesn't change anything. If my kids go off the rails in Jesus, that doesn't change what he has done. And it's tying our sense of who we are to something greater than our circumstances. I think we all wrestle with this idea inside of ourselves that we are not who we should be or not who we could be. And we wonder where that leaves us. And there's this internal sense of tension. And we often go in search of trying to look to something or someone to redeem us, to make us valuable, to make us important, to make us matter. And Paul says, oh, that issue has already been settled in a relationship with God. He redeemed you. He paid a price to set you free to follow. So all those ways in which we seek to find that sense of self-identity is found in him. And it cannot be changed. 
Here's a picture, I think, of what Paul's talking about. And I think there's an important sense of this image that we need to burn into our hearts and souls that I will not find ultimate freedom in establishing my own redemption. It's found in what God has done for me. And the more that we understand that, not just in our heads, but when that makes its way into our hearts, I think it frees us up in so many different ways to no longer be enslaved. But I'll be honest and say, you know what, this side of heaven in this world, I think there are many ways in which we learn what that means and we learn to work it out um, for, for many, many days and for many years. But in him, we have redemption. Three more truths about you and Jesus. Also, I am infinitely valued. Back in that same verse, in him we have redemption, how? Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. See, Jesus did something that we need to understand to be very personal. It's not that Jesus just one day said, you know what, you've been redeemed. There was actually a payment that needed to be made to get enslaved people out of that bondage out of that enslavement. Well, how does that happen? Through his blood. That's the price that Jesus was willing to pay. And sometimes we think, for the world. Yeah, that's true. You know what else it includes? You. That's the price he was willing to pay for you. It's personal. And came at great expense to him. Jesus leaving heaven one day coming to this world and living the life that we should have lived but we couldn't live because of who we are by nature and by choice and then sacrificing that life on a cross to make payment for the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins. Every mean word we've ever said, every wrong desire we've ever entertained, anything we've ever done to harm anyone or anything, and any time we've never measured up to our own standards, much less God's, that's what Jesus did by making that payment. And what somebody is willing to pay for something gives you a sense of how much value that object has. Let me illustrate for you this way, a real simple way. I got a couple boxes up here. So I have the blue box and I have the red box and the contents of these boxes, I'm not gonna tell you what they are, but I'm gonna tell you this. They were bought at a price and the person who bought it knows what's inside and so they were willing to pay these respective prices. This blue box was purchased for $100. What's inside? Not gonna tell you. This one was purchased for a million dollars. What's inside? Not gonna tell you. So if I were going to offer you one of these boxes from people who paid a price knowing what was here, would you choose the $100 box or would you choose the million dollar box? I think we would all go, yeah, this is the one that you want. I don't know what's inside, but if somebody who does know what that value is and they were willing to pay that, yeah, give me that one. Here's what Jesus was willing to pay for your redemption. How valued are you? in a relationship with him, infinitely valued. Because that's the price that he paid for you. And it's personal. And I heard somebody once say it this way, you know, and if you were the only person in the world, he still would have done it. But that's what he did for you. One more thing that Paul helps us understand, that in Christ, I am also part of something bigger than myself. Check this out. Making known to us, so redemption through his blood and by the riches of his grace, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And there are a lot of phrases and this is really tightly packed. Let me see if I can uh, lay it out for you this way. That what he's talking about is that, you know, there was this mystery that all on our own, humanity would not understand in and of themselves, what is God up to and what is all of this about? Why is there something rather than nothing? Is there meaning and value to life and, and actions that are committed here and words that are spoken? And the word mystery can actually be translated secret. 
And that doesn't mean it's an ongoing mystery. This is saying, here's the revealing of what has been a mystery for so long. That according to his purpose, there is a purpose in this world, which he set forth in Christ. The centerpiece of God's purpose, the centerpiece of his plan is Jesus. His life, his ministry here in this world, his death, his resurrection. That's the centerpiece of what he's trying to do. And where's it all going? To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And I think it's really important for us to understand, here's one man's opinion. I think one of the mistakes of our day and our culture is that we have made me, myself and I the highest thing, the highest good. And the more that we put ourselves in that position, the more we fall short of what we were truly made for which is to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. It's not about us, but it includes us. And there is a purpose and a plan that God is carrying out, and the centerpiece of that is none other than Jesus himself. And what this helps us understand is that William Shakespeare and Macbeth was wrong. You know what I mean by that? Can I take you back to high school English class? How many people were forced to read William Shakespeare back in the day and hated every minute of it um, like I did. Yeah, so here's a quote from Macbeth. Here's what he says about life and all that there is. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour on the stage and then is heard no more. A tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Boy, there's a reason to get out of bed every morning, isn't it? <laughs> He's basically saying it all has no meaning. How depressing. And I'd go even one step further. I don't know if you know the name Bertrand Russell. He's one of the more famous atheists of the last century. And here's what he said, and I think he's very courageous in saying this, because if you just factor God out about purpose and plan and meaning and all of that, he says, here's where you wind up. Man is the product of causes that had no prevision, could not see ahead of time, of the end they were achieving. That his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations. And we all know what collocations are. No, I had to look that one up. It's when you put things side by side. So in other words, what he's talking about is the accidental firing of atoms in a random way that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life. That's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> He's saying it's all random, there's no meaning, there's no purpose. And the Apostle Paul would go, uh, God would like a word with you. Because there is a purpose and there is a plan. But if you factor God out, what Bertrand Russell is helping us understand, you know, it might look something like this, that, yeah, somebody built a sandcastle here and with your life you build something. But without God, eventually, it all just gets washed away. And that when there is no meaning and no purpose, things may stand for a little while, but they will not stand forever. And the things that you come up with as ideas about what is good and right, just temporary and really not filled with anything of substance. But I wonder if for people who have maybe stared at the ceiling at night or looked at the sky someday and wondered, is there more? And why are we here? And in some way, it's got to matter. And if you've ever entertained those kind of thoughts, I think you're experiencing what the Bible put this way in a book called Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament that says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of humanity. That instinctively, even though we're separated from God when we come into this world, we know that there's something more. There's something bigger. And there's something that we were meant to be a part of as bigger than, than just us. And it's something that is not temporary and something not washed away by the incoming tide of another culture or another time. But something that leads us in the direction of recognizing instinctively we're here for a reason, a purpose, a plan. And Bertrand Russell, if nothing else, I give him the courage for saying, you know, if you factor God out, that's reality right here on the screen. But the Apostle Paul says this, there's a purpose, there's a plan. 
And the centerpiece of that is none other than Jesus. So what does it mean to be a part of that? Well, we begin a relationship with him. But then we follow him. And remember, this is not so that we can earn our way or self-esteem our way into God giving us great things. Jesus says, or Paul says, in Jesus, these things are all given to you in a relationship with him. But we do what Jesus did. And so what did he do? Well, he helped people meet and follow him. He served people who were marginalized, poor, on the outside looking in. So we serve. He experienced community with people here in this world, people that matter to him. And, and so we do community. And we point in God's direction and the invitation that is available to everybody to put their hope and their trust in him. But one day, God will bring it all to a conclusion on the day of his choosing, but it's all going somewhere, and there is a purpose and a plan to all of history. And in Jesus, you're a part of it. And we get to experience life together with him. Join God's plan in the many ways in which that can be carried out. And so Paul's coming down this pike, and I'll tell you, he's not done yet. He says, in Christ, here's what you got. Even in a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And many times when we try to fill in that blank, right, who am I? I am, and here's what I might do, right? I might say, well, I'm a pastor. One day, that's not going to be true anymore. So then who am I? I say, well, I'm a husband. And God willing, that won't change. But it could, right? And then who am I? Well, I'm a father. And God willing, that won't change either. But I think we know it could. And if it does, who am I? And all the different things that we could use to fill in that blank, right? It's all tied to some circumstances that are beyond our control. Things over which we just, we don't know. We hope that things go well, but we don't know. And Paul points us in this direction of saying, you know what, all of these things, and next week he's going to talk about some more. They are not tied to circumstances. They are yours in Christ, in Jesus. And there is nothing and there is no one who can take those things away. What I have in Christ cannot be changed by any challenge. And the times in which we try to fill our sense of identity in ways that get off the rails, I'm going to tell you, it can happen even to somebody in this position. Somebody who does what I do. My wife and I just recently watched a couple docu-series about some of the famous crashes and burns by some people who are doing this very thing, and it frightens me. Because there are people with churches and growing churches and doing all kinds of things, and man, they're life just hit a brick wall going 90 miles an hour. And you can even do this with the desire to have people view you a certain way or to gain some sense of self-worth within ourselves. So no matter who we are, no matter where we might be, there is another option. And that is to anchor our identity in what we have in Jesus. And we sang it before in one of those songs. I am who you say that I am. And that is incredibly good news. Would you pray together with me? God, thank you for who you are and for reaching down into this world and revealing yourself. Because without that, it would be a mystery still. Why are we here? What is it all about? But at the center of your purpose and your plan is a relationship that we can have with the one, Jesus, who has invited us to come to him, to be in a relationship with him. And thank you for all that comes along with that. And God, in the unpredictable days in which we live, may we lean more and more in the direction of what it means to belong to you. And God, help us to know we got 
nothing to prove, not to you, and that what we have has been given by you. You're the one who is carrying out the actions. We are the recipients. So God, free us up from all the junk our hearts and souls get entangled in and help us to live free to respond to the grace that we have been given. And may it be to your honor and to your glory. And so we ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.